Game of Thrones Season 6 Episode 9 Let's Have a Look Marine is under siege by the slavers. Daenerys speaks with Tyrion and he says that the city is doing quite well, apart from the whole being bombarded with flaming rocks bit. Danny is unimpressed and declares she will crucify the slavers, kill all their soldiers and destroy their cities. She is embracing the role of a violent, vengeful dragon queen. Tyrion plays the angel on her shoulder, suggesting that wiping out whole cities might not be the right thing to do. He reminds her of the madness and the cruelty of her father Ares, and tells her about his plan to destroy King's Landing with wildfire. This is an important warning for Danny. hopefully she'll avoid becoming a terrible tyrant like her father. But this is also yet another hint that the wildfire beneath King's Landing is still down there, just waiting for a mad queen to set it off and burn the city. So Danny and Co go chat with the slavers. They demand that Danny surrender, but they seem to have forgotten that Danny has a gigantic bloody dragon. Scratch that, three gigantic bloody dragons who fly in the sky and the CGI looks sick. Meanwhile, the sons of the harpy are up to their usual shenanigans, slaughtering civilians, so Danny's Dothraki and Dario ride in to sweep them away. The whole thing with the Sons of the Harpy has been weird this season. In episode 1, there seemed to be a setup of a mystery to uncover who their leader is, but that never really went anywhere. Apparently, it's just been the slavers funding them all along, which is hardly a surprise. If you want to put on your tinfoil hat, some people theorise that Varus has secretly been behind the Harpy all this time as a way of pushing Danny to leave Marine and go to Westeros sooner. And it is curious that Varys has never once met Danny this whole season, this whole series, but it's probably nothing. So Danny's dragons fly around and burn a slaver ship. They leave most of the ships untouched because Danny wants to capture the slaver navy, not wipe it out. And this is really the first time we've seen adult dragons used in war, and they do seem so destructive and unstoppable. Just imagine what these monsters would do to the armies of Westeros. Hopefully we'll soon see. But yeah, the slavers are basically screwed, so Grey Worm lets their soldiers go free, but Missandei says that one of the slavers must die. The two highborn guys gang up on the lowborn, say to kill him, but in a kinda King Solomon fashion, Grey Worm kills the upper two and lets the lowborn, Yezan, go to warn his slaver friends of the power of Daenerys Targaryen. Over in Westeros, outside Winterfell, the Starks confront the Boltons. Ramsay brings Lords Umber and Karstark, while Jon brings Sansa and Davos and Tormund and Lyanna, so it's pretty clear who's got the cooler squad. The two sides threaten and taunt each other, it doesn't really go anywhere, just setting the stage for the fight that is to come. Back at camp, the Starks strategize, and things don't look good. They just don't have enough men, but they devise a plan as best they can. Sansa gets mad at Jon for not asking her what to do, so he asks her what to do, and she says she doesn't know what to do, but she does give him some really good advice. She says that Ramsay toys with people, baits them, and traps them. She warns him not to do what Ramsay wants him to do, which comes up later on. Then we see Davos talking with Tormund. They find common ground in that they both served failed kings. Davos served King Stannis, and Tormund served the king beyond the wall, Mance Raider. They figure Jon might be a better man to follow, because he's not a king. Funny thing is that there's lots of foreshadowing in the books and the show that Jon may become a king, maybe sooner than we think. But then Jon visits Melisandre. They chat about her god, and while Mel's pretty sure that God has a plan for us all, she says it might not be a nice one. There's a sense of resignation here, a feeling that everything might go terribly wrong, but that there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. Jon tells Mel not to bring him back if he dies in battle. It would have been nice to have seen more of Mel this season. Episode 1 had that revelation of her ancient age, which seemed to set up for some exploration of her character, but we never really got any. We do know, though, that she'll have a role in episode 10, because when Davos goes a-walking, he finds the wooden stag he carved for Shireen, the little girl who was burned by Mel last season. Davos loved Shireen like a daughter, he's going to want justice for her, which means Mel might face dire consequences. Back in Marine, Yara and Theon arrive to meet Daenerys. It would have been cool to have actually gotten some shots of the Ironborn sailing in in the midst of battle, as is happening in the books, but whatever, the Greyjoys are now here, and we start with Tyrion attacking Theon for having been rude to him in Season 1, which is weird because it was actually mostly Tyrion being rude to Theon, so maybe Tyrion just has a bad memory. Danny complains about their respective shitty dads, Ares for Danny, Tywin for Tyrion, Balon for Yara and Theon, and there's a strong feminist undertone here. Between Danny and Yara and Ilaria and Sansa, women are now taking power in a usually male-dominated Westeros. Yara hits on Danny, which gives the shippers and fanfickers something to squee about, and ultimately they agree to work together. Danny will help Yara take the Iron Islands, and Yara will help Danny take Westeros. 
Danny's one condition is that the Ironborn stop raiding and reaving and stealing shit from the other kingdoms, which is not a super realistic demand, because as Yara says, that's the Ironborn way of life. Can they really be expected to suddenly reinvent their whole culture? Danny has the same problem with the Dothraki. When these guys wage war, they rape and pillage, and Danny can't reasonably expect that to quickly or easily change. When Danny invades Westeros, she's bringing foreign cell swords, she's bringing Dothraki screamers, she's bringing ironborn reavers, and some she assumes are good people, but if she's expecting all these groups to just happily get along with a Westerosi after she takes over, she's gonna have a bad time. Back in Westeros, the Stark and Bolton armies face off. Ramsay uses Rickon as bait to draw out Jon, and Jon, being a brave hero and a bloody idiot who didn't listen to Sansa, rides right into Ramsay's trap only for Rickon to get hit at the last minute from an Olympic level archery shot from Ramsay. Rickon really didn't do much this season, didn't have a single line. He just turned up, looked sad, then died, but there's still a lot of hope that he'll be awesome in the books. He's apparently hanging out with Osher and Shaggy Dog on an island of cannibals and unicorns. But yeah, now John's stuck out in the open, so Ramsay activates his trap card, sending his cavalry out to squash John and giving us easily one of the coolest shots in the series with Jon standing and facing the enemy, looking ready for a second death. But the Stark forces ride up behind him, and then we get this crazy, intense combat scene, with horses and soldiers and swords and blood and mud flying every which way. It's pretty stunning. The violence is brutal and chaotic and exciting and sickening all at once. Ramsay keeps firing arrows, Davos and Small John join in, and the bodies pile up until Ramsay surrounds the Stark forces with Bolton shields. He has sprung another trap. As the Boltons close in, Wun Wun does a surprisingly bad job of trying to break free, torment Mike Tyson's small John, and things start getting a bit too cosy, with John almost crushed by the mass of bodies in a shot reminiscent of Daenerys at the end of season 3, but without the uncomfortable racial imagery. Then when all hope seems lost, the Knights of the Vale ride in to save the day, like the Rohirrim at Helm's Deep. Except instead of being led by Gandalf, they're led by Littlefinger, a decidedly less trustworthy ally. Ramsay retreats to Winterfell, Jon gives chase, Wun Wun breaks the gate and is killed by an arrow from Ramsay, which is actually super tragic because as far as we know, Wun Wun is the last of his species. Along with the children of the forest, this is the second apparent extinction of the season. The two native inhabitants of Westeros are now, as far as we know, totally gone. There are bits about this in the books. It's like a Lord of the Rings type deal with the old races of magic and nature disappearing and being replaced by the world that men have made. Here's a sad little song sung by wildlings eulogizing the giants. So John punches Ramsay in the face 21 times and Ramsay somehow not only survives but is left with a face that still looks like a face just got some red paint on it which feels kind of silly really but regardless the Starks now have Winterfell. Which pleases Mel because she foresaw this long ago. I have seen myself walk along the battlements of Winterfell. I have seen the flayed man banners lowered to the ground. What Mel doesn't know is that Davos is eyeing her. He wants justice for Shireen, and there's a really cool way this could go down. It may be that Mel will be put to death for the murder of Shireen, so Jon might execute Mel. And if he does, his sword may be set alight with Mel's inner fire, transforming it into Lightbringer, the flaming sword of Azor Ahai, the hero prophesied to save the world from the White Walkers. This might not be likely, at least in the show, but it would be pretty sick. The Starks have recovered Rickon's body, even though those cavalry charges should have reduced it to a bloody slurry, and Jon says he'll bury the body in the Winterfell crypts. And this is exciting, because there's heaps of mystery and foreshadowing surrounding these crypts. Ned and Bran and Rickon and especially Jon all have dreams of the crypts. Fans believe that there's some secret deep inside relating to R plus L equals J, so probably with the help of Bran's visions next episode, we're almost certainly finally gonna get confirmation of Jon's true parentage. Then we have the final scene of the episode, with Sansa killing Ramsay by feeding him to the same dogs that he used to kill others. You could call that poetic justice, but in a weird way, Ramsay wins here. Before he dies, Ramsay tells Sansa that he's part of her now, and some people think that means that Sansa's pregnant or something, but what this really means is that Ramsay changed Sansa from someone gentle and compassionate to someone sadistic and cruel like him, because it is sadistic to have someone eaten alive by dogs and to enjoy it, to watch it and smile at someone else's horrific suffering. That's not the Stark way, that's not what Ned would have done, clean and honourable and respectful. 
Feeding someone to dogs and watching for pleasure is exactly the sort of thing that Ramsay would do. By inflicting this revenge, Sansa has stooped down to his level. She has allowed herself to be consumed by the same bloodthirst that she hated in Ramsay. She killed him, but she allowed his cruelty to become part of her. So, who rules the North now? With Rickon dead, and Bran still believed dead, and Jon still believed a bastard, Sansa should now be the head of House Stark. But Littlefinger is the one with the power here, right? He controls the biggest army, and we know that he wants to rule the North. Last season, he makes a deal with Cersei to name him Warden of the North if he takes Winterfell. So maybe Littlefinger will take Winterfell from the Starks and rule the North himself. Or maybe he'll want to marry Sansa, join his power to hers, and rule the North together. Maybe that was Sansa's plan all along. Maybe that's why she didn't tell Jon about the Knights of the Vale. Because if she just told Jon that she had an army coming, he wouldn't have had to rush into that losing battle. He could have just waited for the Knights of the Vale to arrive and saved thousands of northern lives. Maybe Sansa wanted this. Maybe she planned to have the armies of the North destroy each other so that she and Littlefinger could mop up and be sure to have Winterfell to themselves. And maybe Sansa still hasn't forgiven Littlefinger for having given her to Ramsay and for being a manipulative scheming creep generally and will kill him after taking power, leaving her in control with all the power as the Warden, even the Queen in the North. Of course, it's not clear if Jon will be cool with all this, and given all the hints about him and kingship, given the probable revelations about his parentage next episode, it may be that he'll make some claim as the king in the north, or even of Westeros. So this could go a bunch of ways, with Littlefinger, Sansa, and Jon all vying for power. The situation in Marine, of course, is clearer. With the defeat of the slavers, Danny's power is now unquestioned. She's got her three dragons, her Dothraki, her Unsullied, second sons, her Ironborn with all their ships. Danny now has what she needs to sail west to Westeros. The only likely complication left is Euron. So yeah, this episode was pretty awesome. It plays to the strengths of the show, because the show is sometimes bad with plot and character, but what it really does well is spectacle. These shots of dragons above marine and the Battle of Winterfell are stunning, and something you can never get from a book. So for all the shortcomings of the show, it is still great TV, and we're really lucky to see this story in both mediums. So that's nine episodes down, one to go. Thank you all for watching so far, and special thanks to all the patrons for supporting this channel on Patreon, including Philip Bond, Moiraine Sade, Muhammad El Kabi, Johanna Kamler, Mindy Rosetto, Katie Murphy, Sephora Rothschild, Jacob Zaks, Mona Pandya, Elizabeth Fromm, Michael Howie, and Dirk. Cheers.